After we have heard questions from those in the room, we will then entertain questions from those joining by phone. Please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. I will restate each question before turning it over to the panellists to answer so that the reporters on the phone can hear. Yes, so, sorry, glasses. This gen gentleman, straight ahead, yes. Uh, Neil Osterweil uh, with Frontline Medical News. Uh, questions for uh, Dr. Armand and, and uh, Dr. Moskowitz. Um, what about, co if, do we think we might be seeing in the future combinations of checkpoint inhibitors, uh, you know, uh, different targets in melanoma, at least for one drug, but um, w are we gonna be seeing that? Are people looking into those? So the question is, will we be seeing combinations? Yes, combination of, P of PD-1 inhibitors, different P inhibitors. Combinations together, of, right. PD of yes. PD-1 inhibitors being used together. Right. Uh, I mean, in the near future? Yeah. Um, well, I don't think in the near future. Yeah. Um, I think we're trying to figure out, it, it's a little, you know, Hodgkin lymphoma is quite different than melanoma, obviously. Mm -hmm. we, we cure almost all the patients, and these drugs have very high single agent activity. Um, I personally would like to see how they play in the sandbox with standard treatments mm -hmm. before trying to further exploit the immune system. Yeah, that's going to be my next question, actually. And, and it may be that uh, I think it's not likely that different PD-1 antibodies will be used together, but it's possible that PD-1 antibody will be used with other checkpoint inhibitors that target parallel pathways. Uh, there's a study that's ongoing now, uh, actually the follow-up to the study that, uh, that I was talking about, which combines a PD-1 blocker with a CTLA-4 blocker, which is another checkpoint pathway. Ipilimumab, yes. as was yes. done in melanoma. But it, it may be, as Dr. Musk was saying, it, it may be that the answer lies in combining it with standard types of therapy uh, or with immune therapy or both. Time will tell. Hi, I'm Rob Valansky with Hemong today. Dr. Bollard, if you could just give one or two quick thoughts, you know, just offer some perspective on each of the four studies, or a couple of them, or whichever ones you feel are most interesting. <laughs> I would just I, like to I, 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 I told you, I told you this was gonna happen. <laughs> so I think it's very important to emphasize that actually all these are extremely important. and. Um, and actually I see them all as very synergistic and could be ultimately used together because ultimately I think our goal is to overcome the use of chemotherapy radiation which as you know blasts everything healthy and and malignant cells and this way is, you know all the strategies you heard here today are really those to target the tumor cells themselves by using our own immune system to attack the cancer. So it's extremely exciting. The caveat, as you hear, especially with the successes of the CD19 targeted therapies, is you know, when you really rev up the immune response, there is some toxicity associated with that. So ultimately, I think we will have to try and balance you know, how much you can excite the immune system um, and, you know, whether it's sort of a stepwise fashion rather than just using all the therapies together. But I think it's so exciting because I see it as a way forward to how it will revolutionise the treatment of haematologic cancers. Yes. Uh, hi, Caroline Hill with Gasco Post. Um, about the PD-1s, uh, the endocrinopathy has been an, a concern in melanoma. Uh, do you see, you, you, you just, somebody mentioned just a line about them, but can you elaborate? Did you not see any endocrinopathies that do not resolve? Endocrinopathies with the PD-1 yes. well, I think that, uh, at least for, I'll discuss it at the, at the major at the ma presentation, the ma I'm but go they to have that. been reported right. um, at, in, in, in other studies, in solid tumor studies, right. and they certainly are, are seen in these studies as well. Okay. But, they're re but they're, 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 they tend to be easy to treat. They do, because they're long-lasting in the melanoma studies. Oh, they're probably long-lasting in the hematologic oncology studies as well, but, but they can be treated. Okay. Yeah. And also, and did you um, look at the genetic, do a genetic analysis the way Dr. Ar Armand did? Looking you know, the, I think um, you know. I think samples are available, but they have not been done yet. Uh, hard to imagine, though, it won't be similar. Okay. And one more question: Are there any other hematologic malignancies that have that same genetic abnormality that might respond to PD ones? 
Um, so so one that of them, I, I can answer that if, if I may. Uh, one of the other tumors that is very similar genetically is a subset of diffuse large B cell lymphoma called primary mediastinal large cell lymphoma, which was included in, in both of these studies. But the patients, uh, fortunately, are, are rare because frontline therapy works quite well for this disease. So it's hard to know whether it's hard to know uh, where, whether it will have the same kind of responses. Um, it may not be quite as sensitive as Hodgkin lymphoma. Those are really the only two that, that we think have uh, this genetic background. Uh, for P1 bucket. Okay. Sorry, uh, Lynn Peterson here. with Trends in Medicine. So, Dr. Moskowitz, the overall response rate was lower for pembrolizumab than for nivolumab in the bentuximab uh, failures. Can you address that? Was um, yeah, I just think that um, 66 versus 87 percent. I mean, that's a substantial difference. I, I actually, I actually think that you know. In fact, both of us quite study both drugs. Okay, so uh, it just so happens that these how the presentations are. I, I see the, the drugs as very similar, quite frankly. I mean, it's just a matter of the patients that you get. It's probably not related to, to the drug itself. I th my gut feeling is is that at the end of the day, the response rates will be very similar. The complete response rates will be similar. Um, I think that the toxicity profiles may be slightly dissimilar, and we'll have to see what happens when these, when these studies are both peer-reviewed. Uh, but um, I think the results are very similar. I, I agree. I think you, you should be careful to make conclusions on uh, this kind of number of patients. There is still some heterogeneity in the patients or in their tumors, or possibly biological heterogeneity. And if you compare, you, you can't compare response rate of 65 and 87 percent and really conclude that the drugs are different. Uh, it, it could be at the end of the day, but, but I don't think we can conclude that from the current crop of studies. Okay, question down here. Uh, yeah, Michael Smith, MedPage Today. This is a question for, uh, for the non-PD folks. Um, Dr. <laughs> Gokbujit, I wonder, you have an odd kind of, uh, this is a whole new endpoint for me. I've never heard of it before. And uh, I, I didn't really quite follow your explanation of what an MDR complete response was. Um, so my, my take was that people with MDR have a small amount of, uh, of, of residual disease, and you somehow are knocking that down completely or knocking it down to undetectability or what? So the question is regarding the MRD endpoints for the blinatuma MAP study. Okay, it's about MRD. And um, MRD me means that um, the blast count is no longer detectable by conventional methods, uh, which is... Uh, microscopy of the bone marrow smear. So the blast count is in the beginning of the treatment already below 5%. And uh, still it can be quantified uh, by these PCR-based technical ontologies. You can, you can exactly say this patient starts the treatment with, for example, 0.1% or 0.2% or whatever. And um, of course, uh, in these patients, you need also a new response classification because the conventional classification doesn't work anymore. So this is the MRD-based response evaluation, meaning um, uh, that uh, the, it is just a lower sensitivity level. So MRD response means then that with a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 4, you cannot detect any blast cells anymore. So uh, you just uh, put down the sensitivity from the 5%, which is cytology, to 0.01%, which is for MRD evaluation. It's just another cut point uh, for sensitivity. But still, you measure quanti uh, quanti in a quantified way the tumor load. Zero, no? How many zeros is that? 0.01% <laughs> <laughs> is the sensitivity. So you can detect with this method one in 10,000, one blast in 10,000 normal cells. Okay, so this gentleman there, and we'll then this gentleman in the back. <laughs> um, Peter Droppert, mm -hmm. Biotech Strategy Blog for Dr. Group. Um, very impressive data from my point of view, and I remember you from here last year's data as well. So great to see this continuing. Um, could you t tell me a little bit about what your thoughts are on what causes the cytokine release syndrome? Um, is this something that we're going to be able to engineer CARTs to deal with uh, because we're seeing this across all of the, the CART 
de in development. And also, could you share a little bit of commentary on the different, is there any differences between pediatric data and the adult data? Because obviously data at this meeting for CTL019 with um, you know, the adult ALL data with patient deaths, is, is the immune system of children different or is it the same um, what, what we're seeing between the two? Thanks for, the, for your thoughts on right. all of that. So yeah. the question for the reporters on the phone is related to the cytokine release syndrome we're mm -hmm. seeing with the CD19 CAR T cells. So uh, I think that the cytokine release syndrome is an important toxicity. As I've shown you, it is very much related to how much disease the patients have. Uh, the key to the cytokine release syndrome, and I believe this carries across platforms and actually may uh, also apply to plenitumumab, is the um, amplification of the macrophage system through interleukin-6. This is a classical feedback loop that is uh, actually druggable, and so we target it in these patients using tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 receptor blocker, and that has uh, remarkable control of the uh, cytokine release syndrome toxicity. So all of those severe patients that I showed you had gotten tocilizumab and experienced within hours in many cases, but within uh, two or three days in all cases, resolution of their cytokine release syndrome. So in the absence of this IL-6 pathway control opportunity, I think that the, uh, uh, the toxicities would be quite daunting. As far as the differences between an adult and pediatric uh, data, um, I think that it, uh, there are presentations at ASH for some limited, um, uh, 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 there's some limited um, uh, data available in the adult ALL population. However, we started in pediatric ALL before the adults did and they have far fewer patients. So I think it's way too early to be able to say what the differences are in terms of the um, uh, uh, efficacy or the potential toxicity. As an example, in the New England Journal paper where we had 25 kids and five adults, the first five adults all went into remission, so there was a 100% CR rate. Is that different from 88 or 92? Hard to say. So I think the answer is that we, we need a lot more experience in both populations to be able to make any kind of comparative statements. Cytokine release syndrome, syndrome exists in both populations and is very much related to disease burden in both populations. <coughs> Hi, uh, Ed Sussman with um, um, MedPage Today for Dr. Armand. Um, have you calculated the uh, um, median duration of response in your, in your patients? So is this regarding the PD-1 blocker, yeah, yeah. Um, the volumumab, and uh, the median duration of response? So we have, technically the median duration response uh, is 52 weeks, but uh, this number is a little bit misleading because most of the patients, as you can see, have ongoing responses and so they get censored early. So at this point, it's too early to really get a sense of it. We know that there are durable responses and one of the patients uh, who is on the, the graph that I showed uh, stopped the drug for toxicity. So, so stop the drug was in complete remission at the time and at the time of the data lock uh, was 16 weeks out and was still in complete remission without any further treatment. So one of the questions which, which we now have to address is when you get patients in remission with these drugs, how long do they last and can you stop the drug at some point? And I had one other question on, on that same um, graph showing the patient response. You had one patient that did look like did very much worse than everyone else. Have you looked at those patients who didn't respond to find out if there's something different about them? So th um, there are patients who progressed on treatment on this study. Uh, we don't have yet any sense of why that is. One of the most interesting ways to answer that question would be to have tumor material from the time of relapse so that you can see does it change and how does it escape uh, PD-1 blockade. We don't have any of that information now, and it's, it's unfortunately, th those samples are hard to come by, but, but with larger studies and uh, more patients, we hope to be able to answer that, because that's an excellent question. Nick Mulcahy from Medscape, question for Dr. Bollard. Um, do you look forward to the day when you'll be installing a uh, a CAR T cell unit at your center and treating patients, and uh, is such a, a, a notion possible, Dr. Grupp? Is is uh, you know some some way to uh, re uh, to manufacture this and some and kind of scale it out to other centers, or is it going to be just at uh, a few isolated places? So and and what kind of what would be the time frame for something like that? 
So this is a question for yes, me or for Dr. You and then Dr. <laughs> okay. So you know, this I think is the field of cell therapy. I think is you know what model do we follow? Do we follow the pharma model or do we follow the HSCT hemato you know BMT model? And so I think one very exciting thing about the CAR T cell therapy field is that there has been so much interest from pharma and. With that, then I think we will start seeing these more centralised manufacturing models where they centrally manufacture the product and ship them out to the various centres. And I know Dr. Grupp will talk to you about the, the phase two study, which is planned, which will be very important multi-centre study to show that that model is totally feasible. Um, so not all cell therapeutic strategies are maybe going to fit that model, but you're right, it could, um, I think that's the model that could, if provided that pharma can, remains invested in this, that will be the one to broaden applicability in the shortest time frame. So uh, of course I agree with everything Kath has said. So the, the, I think the key, two key questions here are, Toxicity and logistics. Uh, we've talked about toxicity already. Logistics um, is, are we going to be actually able to develop these personalized products for every patient? Mm -hmm. So Novartis has licensed this therapy. They uh, have uh, built a cell manufacturing facility. There is a multi-site pediatric uh, phase two trial that actually is in progress and is uh, um, uh, uh, enrolling patients at multiple pediatric centers. So How many the, the eventual rollout will be to eight or nine pediatric centers. Um, and so that's open now. Uh, patients have already been treated on that uh, um, uh, study, both at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia as the initial site, but as, at other sites as well. So that's happening now. And so we will test our ability to both to use this therapy in other uh, pediatric hospitals and with an adult study to follow. And uh, I think very importantly to understand this key question of logistics. Can we collect a, uh, a um, cell uh, sample? Can we send it to a centralized manufacturing facility? Can we send it back? And that's, of course, the process we've used at CHOP because Penn has made our cells, and so we've already had to do that. But uh, now we're doing it across the country, multiple sites from the West Coast to the East Coast. Janine Budding, Netherlands. I have a question about the CAR study. Dr. Group, um, can you tell a little bit more about the population? Did you see any differences between boys and girls or any racial differences? Um, so the answer to your question is that we didn't really see any uh, gender disparities in terms of uh, response and also I, I, we didn't have enough patients uh, to really make any statement about genetic uh, differences as you know very well. There are uh, uh, racial differences in, uh, in terms of response to upfront ALL therapy and especially the Hispanic population is overrepresented in the uh, relapsed uh, ALL population. But in 39 patients we really aren't in a position to be able to sort that out. It's a great question. Um, what I hope is that the genetic characteristics of ALL that lead to a poor response don't really aren't of interest to the CAR T cells who, that are just attacking this, the surface molecule. Uh, I don't have data to answer your question, so I, I have seen no signal whatsoever that suggests to me that there's going to be differences. This gentleman down here. Neil Canavan, Pharma Times. Uh, for Dr. Grupp, this is a follow-up to comments that have already happened. As far as logistics, uh, your, your feeling about the possibility of allogeneic cars, and as far as toxicity, um, there was a lot of talk after the, the Juno, Juno incident about a kill switch. Or is that still being considered? So uh, there are several questions in that. So the first question is allogeneic cars. So there are two possibilities here. One is that you would uh, truly use an allogeneic car, which is in a patient who's undergone a transplant, go back to their donor and collect T cells from that patient. Or uh, the more exciting notion is that you might actually take uh, third party cells, engineer out the possibility for alloreactivity, and then give those cells back. If that's possible, then we have one donor to many patients instead of one donor to one patient. So that would be very exciting. There's no data yet to show that that's going to work, but people are working on that. I think it's very exciting. Um, the, from our standpoint, the way we've approached the allogenicity question is we've had two-thirds of our patients already had a transplant. 
We collect their cells. Those cells are of donor origin. The median uh, donor chimerism in these patients in the T cell compartment is 100 percent. So we know that we can collect those cells, we can activate them, we can give them back, and we don't see any GVHD. So we've really focused on using allo cells from the recipient of the transplant and not from the donor. Um, as far as the kill switch, that's a very important technology. Uh, people are looking at that, but the car development program at Penn has not focused on that particular aspect at this time. Okay, we'll take one more question from the floor and then um, we will do the phone, right? Yes, this one is done. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, uh, Peter Drop at Biotech Strategy blog, blog for Dr. Group again. Um, just following on with questioning there, um, in terms of the future for CAR T cells, um, you, you're adopting approach, this isn't a bridge to transplant. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Is that does that mean you know, where WIS could be a replacement for transplant in the future, more frontline? Is that the vision in ALL and where you see it going? And if so, when, where, how, what the steps we need to do before we go there? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, uh, I mean, I am a bone marrow transplanter by trade. Um, I uh, see how s successful and unsuccessful bone marrow transplant is for ALL. I would love it if this tech technique with this technology would replace bone marrow transplant. Um, uh, whether or not that's possible, I think the fact that we're seeing longer term disease control in some of these patients and that these families have had the willingness to make a decision, which is entirely up to them, whether to proceed with transplant or not, and allowed us to understand what the characteristics are of long-term disease control. I think that for the first time, we're beginning to look, see what it might look like to be able to ask that question. So in the future, could I imagine instead of this being a bridge to transplant, it's a replacement? That would be my fondest hope. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're a lot closer than we used to be. Okay, thank you very much. Now we would like to open up the phone lines for questions. Uh, is there a, the operator who can ask if there are any questions from our listeners? Thank you. Yeah, question on the phone line. Please press star one more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the floor? Uh, the, yeah, one more question from the floor. So this is Lynn Peterson from Trends in Medicine. Dr. Grupp, you had 10 relapses, and can you tell us about those patients? Yeah, so I think we were recognizing two patterns of uh, relapse uh, in these patients. So. Most of the patients hang on to their cars for a long time, but patients who lose their cars within about two to three months are at higher risk for CD19 positive relapse, and we've actually successfully retreated a few of those patients. Um, so that's one pattern that we've, uh, that we've seen. The other pattern is patients who've had longer term car persistence, but then recur with CD19 negative disease, and we've seen that in a handful of patients. And some of those patients had been expi uh, exposed to another CD19 directed therapy, which is blinatumumab. I don't know if there's any connection there at all, but of course it's been seen in blinatumumab as well. Blinatumumab. Um, but I, I don't know if there's, I mean, there's far too few patients to really say anything than that. But it, what we're seeing is the T cells are killing all the CD19 negative cells, but there are a few CD, sorry, CD19 positive cells, but there are a few CD19 negative cells that form the, the basis for a relapse. And so that is definitely something that hasn't happened in a lot of patients. We've definitely seen it. Okay, so that concludes this press conference. Uh, thank you for everybody for your participation today. Thank you.